let me first uh, welcome and present to, to the distinguished audience, uh, Ricardo Puebla, who is our speaker, speaker today. So he first uh, did his uh, undergraduate studies in, in the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, then a master in science in nuclear physics, together with uh, he, he, his master thesis was done under the supervision of Armando Relaño and Joaquin Retamosa. Then a PhD thesis in UL in the group of Martin Plenio. Uh, by the way, his thesis got the Springer thesis prize. And then he got a postdoc in Queen's University in Belfast in the group of Mauro Paternostro. Nowadays, he is a postdoc in the group led by Juan Jose Garcia Ripoll at the IFF, the Instituto de Física Fundamental of the CSIC in, in Madrid, and he's currently working on quantum information and, and computation. So this is the, the presentation. Today, he's going to speak about critical phenomena in the quantum rabbi model, and he's going to, to put in context ground, excited state and dynamical quantum phase transitions in a talk that I'm sure will be very, very interesting. So thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, for volunteering and for speaking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, uh, indeed, and also to Jose Enrique um, for, well, for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present my, some part of my results or my work uh, here. And as Kuro said, I'm going to talk about uh, critical phenomena in the quantum gravity model, and basically covering a bunch of um, different different topics, right? So I will talk about the quantum phase transition as well as the side state way phase transition um, in a final component system, together with the dynamical uh, quantum phase transition as well, right? And then the implications between the ESQPT and uh, in this in this system. So overall, I will try to convince you that um, it is possible to find critical phenomena in a finite component system. And for that, uh, this is the outline of the talk. So first, I will give you um, an introduction and trying to motivate why is it possible to find a finite component phase transitions with a sort of hand wave argument. Um, but hopefully, that will be clear once we focus on the quantum gravity model. And as I said, basically, um, we will go through all these um, critical phenomena, right? So the QPT is QPT and also the DPT um, and this moment. And finally, um, I will present a, or I will give a brief overview of how to explore uh, these critical phenomena with a single trap ion experiment. And so basically, I will be talking today um, about the results of these Four, uh, four publications that I did, um, the first three I did during the PhD um, under the supervision of Martin Plenio in, university, uh, in the University of uh, Ulm in Germany. And together in collaboration with uh, Mian Jun Juan and Jorge Castanova, who were uh, postdocs uh, at that time in the group. Okay, so let's start with the introduction. So we will start, or I would like to start basically with the um, basics of statistical mechanics. So basically, we know that a uh, given uh, system can be described, or uh, no, um, a system made of many particles can be described uh, in terms of the partition function, right? So basically, the partition function is nothing but the sum uh, of these exponential uh, over the energy of the k to the microstate configuration uh, divided by the, the temperature, right? So basically, this h of uh, sigma k uh, basically represents the energy of this kth uh, microstate. And from this partition function, then basically we know that we can uh, derive the microscopic value of the, of the system, right? of an observable A. And as well, uh, from the partition function, it follows other thermodynamic quantities like the Helmholtz free energy. And as we know, different phases of matter, it can be characterized in terms of an order parameter, right? Uh, depending on the, on the external, uh, external uh, parameters, such as the uh, external magnetic field or, uh, or the temperature that we can represent by G uh, in this case. And the order parameter um, will behave if there is a um, phase transition, essentially different phases of matter, and will show different, and different behavior. So for example, in the continuous phase transitions, we know that the order parameter 
will close or will vanish uh, continuously, but in this uh, singular manner. While it is also possible to find first order phase transitions in which the order parameter basically shows an abrupt uh, jump, a discontinuity. And examples are, are plenty in nature, right? So we know, for instance, the, the transition from water um, to ice and also to the, to the gas um, phase, and also in thermomagnetism or even in more exotic um, 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 systems such as in superconductivity. So what is the standard notion of for phase transition? So we know um, that there is a partition function um, involve a sum over all in the microstates of the system. So therefore, for any finite system or any finite number of particles, as we are taught in, in statistical mechanics, then basically we will obtain a smooth and well-behaved properties. So true singularities or criticality is only possible uh, once you take the thermodynamic limit, once you take an infinite sum in the, in the partition function. This also applies to quantum many body systems. Um, where basically um, the, the number of microstates will now be, be given uh, or will be translated in terms of the dimension of the Hilbert space. So for example, in, the, in a spin um, one half system uh, of n particles, then basically we know that the, the Hilbert space dimension uh, is given by two to the n. And in the thermodynamic limit, basically when you have infinitely large number of particles, then it is possible, uh, depending of course of the, on, the, on the system, that, the, that you recover some sort of a critical um, properties, such as, for example, the diverging um, correlation length or the closing of the energy gap at the critical point, as well as the behavior of the, of the order parameter. In all of this system, uh, basically uh, the ground state uh, in the thermodynamic limit is spanned by this infinitely large Hilbert space. Um, and this is uh, an important, impo important point I want to, to make. So how is it possible uh, to obtain phase transitions in a finite component system? So essentially for that, um, we will need a system uh, with an inherently, inherently unbounded uh, Hilbert space. So basically, we can take um, um, a bosonic mode, for instance, with an unbounded spectrum, and you have already an um, infinitely large uh, Hilbert space. But not only that, because basically we know that an, um, an harmonic oscillator per se is very boring, right? I mean, it doesn't show any, any critical features. So what we need is that the ground state must be spanned by this infinitely large number of states within the Hilbert space. And I will show you, or I will try to convince you that this can be achieved by tuning the system parameters um, that we can denote here by, by eta. Um, that will be clear later on what I mean by this. So basically uh, it is possible to find a finite component system um, by tuning the system parameters rather than by scaling up the, the number of particles. So in that, case, in, the, in that scenario, what we find is the following distinction. So on the one hand, you have the standard quantum many body systems, where, for example, as I said, the uh, n spin one half um, the system, basically in the, in the Hilbert space is true to the n. And in the thermodynamic limit, you will find all these, all of these uh, critical uh, behavior, for example, in a one dimensional Ising model, right? And on the other hand, we have these finite component systems where basically we don't scale up the number of uh, particles. So basically they, they will remain fixed, but they have an, an already uh, infinitely large Hilbert space. And by tuning the system parameters, we will be able to explore the whole Hilbert space. And therefore it will be possible to, to find criticality. Of course, one, uh, one uh, price to pay is that the correlation length um, will be not diver diverging because essentially you, you, cannot, you cannot have more correlations than your, 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 uh, your system, right? So this is one of the main difference with respect to, to quantum many body systems, right? But this also applies to other fully connected models like the DK or the lipkin mesh uh, model, right? Okay. So how can we um, observe these finite component phase transitions? So the, uh, one, one example, and typically what we have been done so far, is to consider a bosonic mode, with, which provides with an with a infinitely large Hilbert space, interacting with a spin one half. And there are different models in, 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 this, um, in this general um, uh, scenario, such, such as 
the James Cummings model that probably all of you know, the quantum rabbit model, which is going to be the example that I will explain here today, and also generalize a finite number of atoms, decay models, and, and so on. So all of these models will show a rich phenomenology and um, showing quantum phase transitions, also dissipative ones, uh, the side state quantum phase transitions and dynam dynamical ones. So basically there is a rich phenomenology um, in terms of critical phenomena um, in these finite component systems. Um, and moreover, it is also possible to find different universality classes depending on the, uni and the symmetry that your model has. And this means basically different critical exponents. And just to mention uh, uh, some, some works that have been done um, in the last year. So basically, um, this is a non-exhaustive list, of course, on, on theoretical results. And I would like to highlight, for instance, this um, recent paper um, where they show that it is possible to have multicriticality, meaning different phases that coincide at a critical point um, in a sort of generalized uh, finite number of atoms decay models, right? And also, I would like to, to mention that the, there has been an experiment uh, that has been published uh, early this year, which has confirmed the, um, this finite component phase transition um, with a single trap ion experiment. And also, uh, it has opened the, the door to many applications, as for example, scaling laws in non equilibrium dynamics, or also a quantum critically enhanced uh, a metrology. So basically, uh, the, the message that I wanted to, to stress is that it is possible in all, the, you know, in all of these systems to obtain criticality by tuning the system parameters rather, by, rather than scaling up the, the system components. And this can be um, interesting, of course, from a fundamental point of view, but also for pra practical purposes, because it, is, it means that if you are, if you are, um, if you are interested in exploring in critical phenomena, perhaps you don't want to scale up your, your system because it might be challenging or keeping it, to keep it isolated or, or to control it. So therefore you can rely on these finite components uh, phase transitions where you, you, you basically will need to have a tunability of the system parameters, but you will need only to have um, a finite number of them. Okay, so um, as I said, uh, I'm going to focus mainly on the quantum Ravi, Ravi model and let me introduce what, what this model is about. So now, and by the way, I forgot to, to mention that, uh, please, if you have any question, just you know, feel free to interrupt me at, at any time. Okay, so the quantum gravity model um, basically describes a coherent interaction of a uh, spin one half particle with a single bosonic mode of frequency omega naught. And the frequency of the, of the spin is given by, by this capital omega. And they interact through this uh, interaction term that basically um, involve four uh, uh, exchange mechanisms, right? So basically you can absorb or emit a photon at the expense of absorbing or the exciting the, um, the, the spin. And it is important also to note that the Hamiltonian uh, has a set two parity symmetry that is essentially given by the parity of the number of excitations or given by this operator here. So this means that you can label all of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian uh, in terms of this parity, either plus or negative. And if you want, if you want, uh, basically this is just a single uh, atom version of the decay model. Um, so, and this model, uh, it is uh, has been very very relevant to, uh, to study many quantum platforms because it applies there. Uh, such as, for example, in cavity and circuit QED, where basically you have um, either an uh, atomic, uh, so an atom interacting in a, uh, with a, a quantized uh, light mode in a cavity, or with an artificial atom uh, interacting with electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic field, and it also applies in uh, in trap ions, where essentially you can um, create an interaction between the internal degrees of freedom of the the ion with, uh, with the motion in the trap. And as well as in other uh, setups, such as uh, this optical optomechanical system, where you can, uh, you can couple the um, internal degrees of freedom of a, of a defect with a vibration of a, of a membrane. Um, you can find more details in this reference if you're interested. 
And typically in all of these systems, um, and then uh, quantum Ramy model, uh, basically it reduces to, to the James Cummings because the interaction is very weak compared to the frequencies of the, of the mode and the spin. And in that case, basically you can neglect the counter rotating terms and you will obtain the James Cummings model that basically this, uh, describes these radio oscillations and so on. But more interesting physics actually happen in the strong coupling and beyond. And in particular, here we will be interested in a parameter regime where the frequency of the mode is much smaller than the coupling between the, the spin and the, and the mode. And the frequency of the spin is much larger. Essentially, this frequency, this um, big uh, omega, is um, the largest frequency in the system. And in particular, in the limit where this uh, frequency ratio that I will denote by eta goes to infinity, together with a coupling going to infinity uh, respect to the frequency of the mode, um, keeping this ratio finite, it will find all the criticality happening in the system. So if you want, you can associate uh, this eta with the system size of um, a standard uh, quantum many body system. And this other quantity will play the role, for instance, of the volume, and therefore the density will be finite. So it's just to draw an, an analogy with respect to quantum many body systems. And in this parameter regime, we will be able to, to find that the ground state of the quantum gravity model explore the, the infinitely large Hilbert space provided by the bosonic mode. Okay, so let's now focus on the quantum phase transition in the model. And for that, I will show you very briefly how to derive the low energy effective description in this case. So, I'm skipping many details. So if you are interested, you, you can ask me later if you want. Um, so essentially, um, in order to derive the low energy effective description in this, in this uh, limit, where I will denote this, um, the coupling now will become G, which is basically a, a rescale coupling of the original model. And we can transform the, the Hamiltonian uh, using the schiffer wolf transformation in order to obtain a that in a diagonal form of the, um, for the low energy physics, essentially. And in the limit, this becomes the um, exact solution. So the exact FFT description, which is only valid, as you can see here, it, it's only valid for G smaller than one, which actually becomes the critical point. And for G larger than one, this FFT description uh, or FFT model becomes unbounded and below, uh, meaning that the transformation fails. And in order to, to describe what happens in the other phase for G larger than one, we need to first displace the mode um, and then define a new quantization axis for the, for the spin. So basically by doing all of this, uh, one can find the, um, the effective description for the, in the other phase and it acquires its form essentially. But the important thing to note here is that first, it is an exact solution in the, in the limit and second is that the, the, uh, the effective models are, um, are quadratic in terms of A and A dagger. And therefore, basically we can have all the information about the, about the system and about the, the ground state as well. Um, so it can be diagonalized. And from there, we, we find the excitation spectrum. So basically the energy gap. And the energy gap uh, has this form. And as you can see, uh, it basically vanishes at G equal to one, which is a critical point. And according to a standard quantum phase transition theory, um, basically we can define the critical exponent of this system, which turns out to be set mu equal to one half as in any other mean field model, right? Like in DK or LMG models. So um, having the exact solution, we can, we can draw the, or we can um, study the phase diagram of the system for the ground state. And what we find is that there is a normal phase uh, for the coupling um, between zero and one, where essentially the symmetry holds, the disparity symmetry holds, and the ground state is nothing but a, a squeezed vacuum state, and the spin is basically in the, in the lowest uh, state. And the parameter of this sque uh, squeezing uh, is given by this formula, meaning that at g equal to one, what you will have is a infinitely large uh, squeezed vacuum state. On the other hand, when G is larger than one, basically in the other phase, we find the super radiant phase. 
And it's uh, superadian here means uh, that in essentially the number of bosonic excitations um, is infinitely large. And as you can see here, um, the ground state will be, will be, um, there, sorry, there will be two uh, ground states uh, that are equivalent. So basically they have the same energy and they break the spontaneously the um, parity symmetry. And then um, basically the, the, the ground state will be a squeezed vacuum, but displaced. And the displacement will, be, and will give account of the uh, infinitely large number of um, bosonic excitations. And in addition, um, the, new, the new spin degree of freedom is basically in the low state of a new quantized uh, axis. And this will be clear later on when I will show you the, some uh, figures for the spin observables. So basically, the physics of this uh, of this model is very similar to the super radiant quantum phase transition um, in the decay model, for instance, where n atoms are collectively coupled to the bosonic mode. And as in that model, there is no notion of a spatial a spatial dimension. So basically, the correlation length is ill-defined, and and this is because it's a zero-dimensional system. And moreover, basically, the, the critical exponents are the same. So this means that basically they, say, they belong to the same universality class. Ricardo, yep. one question. As you have omega zero going to zero, then it means that it costs no, no energy to have a huge number of bosons in the ground state. This is why, is this the reason for that the number of bosons in the super radiant phase is divergent? So one way of looking at this limit, as you said, is uh, basically taking omega zero to zero. But in that case, you will be looking at um, a classical system um, because basically all the levels of the harmonic oscillator will be collapsing and you will have a continuum. Instead, the other way of looking at it is to take uh, the big omega to infinity. This means that you have a still a quantized uh, energy levels for, the, for your uh, bosonic oscillator. So, uh, and it is essentially where you have this quantum mechanical solution of the quantum gravity model. So the number of the diverging number of um, bosonic excitations comes es essentially because you are um, introducing, so you are um, you are interacting very strongly with the with the spin, and therefore the spin will will pr provide with this diverging number of uh, excitations in the ground state. I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, thanks. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, okay, so then we can look at the ground state properties in this limit. And so here's some examples. So as a function of this uh, coupling G. And here I'm showing you the ground state energy uh, together with a second derivative that becomes this continuous at the critical point as in any, any other um, Quantum, quantum many body system showing a second order quantum phase transition, right? And as well, uh, this is the displacement rescaled by eta, um, reflecting essentially the spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking in the super radiant phase. And also, we can see we can see here the uh, quadratures of the um, bosonic mode, so basically the x and p quadratures, reflecting basically the, the um, the squeezing that is happening in the ground state. So actually, at the at the critical point, the, the ground state is an infinitely squeezed vacuum. Um, below, I'm showing here the order parameters. So basically, the sigma x uh, over the ground state will show the um, the spontaneous symmetry breaking that is happening in the in the spin degree of freedom, as well as the sigma z. So basically, this means that in the super radiant phase, the um, the, the spin acquires, a, acquires coherence, right? And non-zero population of the upper level. And finally, the, the number of uh, bosonic excitations rescaled by eta. So this means that basically in the normal phase, we'll have zero, zero rescale number of uh, bosonic excitations, while in the super radiant phase, this will be, will be huge because it is proportional to eta that is uh, going to infinity. Okay, so this is true for um, for the infinite uh, limit, but what happens whenever you take a finite number of or a finite value of eta, which will be equivalent to take a finite number of atoms in a 
any other point from anybody's system. So of course, uh, what it happens is that there is a crossover, right? I mean, there is no strict singularity uh, and the, all the properties will be well behaved. And as, as you increase uh, this value of eta, they will become more and more pronounced around the critical point. As for example, the sigma z, you can see in the risk and number of excitations or the energy gap. And basically, as you increase eta, then this will go to, to zero, I will close. So, then the question is, um, in a, a standard quantum many body system, a finite number of um, the particles implies essentially a number of relations that are uh, described in terms of the finite size scaling theory. So can we apply here something similar? And the answer is yes. And for that, let me recall what is a finite size scaling theory. So for a, a standard many body system um, behaving in the thermodynamic limit, so for a quantity uh, in a standard many body system in the thermodynamic limit um, has this form. So essentially a quantity that behaves critically, in, critically or sing, singularly um, with a critical exponent alpha. Then for a finite size scaling hypothesis tells you that is based on basically in a, on a cost graining or a normalization group analysis, it states the following. So basically, for a finite number of uh, particles, you will have in this uh, contribution, that is what you will expect in the thermodynamic limit, times a scaling function that depends only on uh, your, the length of your system divided by the correlation length. So it's basically a coarse graining. And if you replace here what you will expect for the um, um, correlation length, then essentially this is the argument of this scaling function. And this scaling function must satisfy in the following properties because um, as, um, requiring this will ensure that for finite number of um, and particles, there, is no, there are no true singularities ha happening in the system. While whenever X goes to infinity, then you should recover the, um, this, this relation. And this means that, that basically this scaling function uh, establishes a relation between what happens in the thermodynamic limit with what happens for a finite number of, um, of particles. And in particular, at the critical point, it follows these sort of uh, scaling relations. So basically, at the critical point, the, your quantity uh, for a finite number of um, atoms n will show, uh, will behave as a n to the power of minus alpha divided by nu where mu is a critical exponent of the correlation length. So how can we apply this in our case? Well, um, in our case, essentially there is no correlation length, and, but still one can apply the same, the same arguments, basically taking this, this uh, functional form here. And this is essentially similar to what happens to fully connected models as it was explained uh, 40 years ago by Botet in, uh, in this nice article. In our case, we will replace essentially this number of atoms by eta, this frequency ratio. But essentially, all uh, will f uh, will hold in the same in the same way. So, um, in our case, basically, what we will expect is that a, a quantity a that behaves in this uh, uh, in the limit in this way will show or will must must uh, show this uh, power law dependence on on eta. And it is important to note that this in critical exponent nu has to be equal for all the, the it must be consistent for all the quantities A that you are considering. So this is something that one can check in the quantum Raman model. Um, and one finds essentially that nu is equal to three halves. And this implies that, um, that um, any quantity A um, should scale as eta to the power of minus two alpha divided by three where alpha is a, a critical exponent of the quantity A. So for example, um, for the in quadrature of momentum of the bosonic uh, mode, we know that basically this is uh, what happens in the, in the limit of eta going to infinity. So alpha will be equal to one four. And therefore we will expect, actually there is a typo here, this should be a minus, sorry for that. So we will expect um, eta going to, so eta, uh, to the power of minus one and six. And the same happens for the energy gap or any other quantity, right? So basically this must be consistent to all the um, um, ground state properties of your, of your system. And 
this is what, uh, what you will find. So basically the points here uh, correspond to different uh, quantities, like the momentum quadrature, energy gap, risk and number of bosonic excitations, or ground state energy. And those, uh, basically these points are the result of a numerical simulation, uh, taking the full Rabi model, while the solid lines uh, are obtained basically uh, using or considering um, one over eta correction to the effective model uh, I, I showed you before. But interestingly, what we find is a very nice agreement with, um, with respect to the to this um, finite eta is, is scaling. So basically, what uh, applies to a um, standard quantum many body system applies here as well, replacing the number of atoms with eta, which is this uh, frequency relation. And moreover, um, this not um, this finite uh, size scaling theory not only tells you about the scaling properties at the critical point but also what happens uh, away from it. And this typically is referred to data collapsing um, for um, basically data collapsing to obtain functions that are um, system independent, so system size independent. And in, in our case, this can be uh, obtained in the following manner. So basically, we know this is the ansatz of the finite um, uh, size scaling theory. Therefore, it means that if you plot um, the, the expectation value of A for a finite value of eta times this quantity, that is what you will expect in the thermodynamic limit, you should obtain something that is eta independent. So basically, it depends only on this scaling variable that I will call x. So depending on the, on the distance to the critical point and on the system size um, in quotation marks, because this is just a frequency ratio, then we should obtain the same behavior. So we should obtain this uh, scaling function. And this is essentially what I'm showing here for um, the energy gap uh, for different values of eta and different at, uh, two sides of the, of the critical point. And as you can see, basically, there is a very nice data collapsing, uh, basically confirming the, the hypothesis of a finite scaling uh, theory. And the same uh, holds for the number of excitations and sigma z, as well as for other, any other quantity. And I would like to stress as well that these finite size of scaling functions uh, are the same uh, within the, mm, the universality class. So if you were to plot the, um, these functions for the DK model, you will obtain the same up to, of course, um, some constant factors. Okay, so with this, I finished the part of the ground state properties. So let me move to, to the side state uh, quantum phase transition to the ESQPT. So um, having one degree of freedom um, and also displaying a quantum phase transition, it's actually um, very natural to, to ask uh, ourselves uh, whether there is a ESQPT in the system. And actually, from previous works, we will expect that the density of the states will be divert, will be diverging logarithmically close to a critical value of the excitation energy. And as you, so basically, this is uh, what we will expect, basically, from previous works and different systems that have uh, that have the similar properties. And in particular, you can see here the energy spectrum of the Rabi model for a reasonably large value of eta. And what you can see here already by, by eye is that there is an accumulation of energy levels right at this critical energy. So here um, there is basically, you, you see basically this normal phase. And then as you go above the critical point, then the ground state becomes twofold degenerate, basically due to the spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking. And this will hold up to uh, this um, critical energy, right? And this perhaps can be better illustrated if you plot the, the energy difference between um, eigenstates with opposite parity. And basically, you can see this region here where this spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, appears. OK, so in order to verify that the density of the states diverge uh, logarithmically in the system, we rely on a semi-classical approximation as typically done in these systems, right? And in order to do that, we introduce these um, semi-classical variables x and p. 
and which will basically lead to this part here that can be um, can be de-analyzed from which you will obtain this effective um, uh, potential. And the low, so basically this minus uh, effective potential, it refers to the low energy subspace. And this is actually um, re reveals or uh, shows the standard single to double weighted shape. So basically for G lower than one, you have the, the minimum of this uh, effective potential equal to zero, which is nothing but the, the, the normal phase. And as you go above the critical point, then you have this bifurcation to uh, reflected here by the, the these two equivalent, equivalent minima in the effective potential. And in, in, interestingly, the separatrix, uh, basically the local maximum um, in this effective potential happens at this critical energy. So therefore we can calculate the density of the states, basically uh, integrating um, the um, over the phase space in this um, energy surf uh, surface, right? Uh, of the semi-classical Hamiltonian. And it is possible to find solutions close to the critical energy where this epsilon now is, is just a rescale uh, energy with respect to the, the absolute value of the critical one. Uh, Ricardo, maybe I, 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 I lost something in the way but but can, can you go to the previous uh, slide sure because when you're looking at the this is like mov moving to the semi-classical approximation you are getting the semi-classical approximation of the bosonic part of the a's but with the spin yeah sorry i didn't explain what happens with so, the spin so basically once you take the um, semi-classical approximation for x and p right you get this hamiltonian but mm -hmm. it still depends on on the spin operators the right spin. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is to diagonalize this part, and then essentially you are, if okay, you are the, the coupling the the, um, the system, right? So basically uh -huh. you will have an effective potential due to the fact that you are interacting with a with a spin. Okay, okay, but but you could have also uh, used spin coherent states, and and but that that will be more. Uh, like, like you're, you're getting states. rid of one degree of freedom here, isn't it? It's... Yes, in a, in a way, yes. Essentially, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, remember that we are dealing with only one one spin. Okay. So it is not as in the in the Dicke model where you will have you no know, this uh, um, large um, large spin. number of spins. Yeah. Exactly. In this case, it's only one, and by by diagonalizing it, basically what you are uh, doing is to restrict to the low energy subspace because okay. mm -hmm. so the the upper branch um, happens whenever the the situation energy is really large because we are taking this eta to be infinitely large right so mm -hmm. yeah okay okay now i now i see thank you okay. thanks to you okay so basically in this low uh, using this low um, effective potential uh, where actually the end is this single to double well a transition, we can find the uh, uh, solutions close to the critical energy. And interestingly, at the quantum phase transition, uh, we find that the density of the states diverges uh, following a power law. So here for the for G equal to one, the critical energy is nothing but the ground state energy. So this means that at the as at the at the ground state energy, there is a diverging number of uh, states. And this is actually uh, what happens because you have an accumulation of all of the levels collapses to to the to the ground state. On the other hand, for whenever you go for g larger than one, um, this power law becomes a logarithmic divergence, and that can be shown to be to follow this form, where k is nothing but a, a constant pre a constant factor, and it essentially marks the the, the presence of a ESQBT in this model. Having these um, analytical solutions, we can test whether this holds for um for the um, for the quantum for the quantum case, and as customary in these uh, in these systems, we can rely on a quantum average density of states, basically taking a window of the states divided by the the width, right? And this corresponds to the points to the yeah to the points I'm showing I'm showing here, and while the lines corresponds to the exact uh, semi-classical density of states. Mm -hmm. 
And as you can see, basically for the normal phase, essentially for here G equal to one fourth, the spectrum is very boring, it's essentially flat. As you get to the quantum phase transition, you see that this is diverging um, as you get closer to the ground state uh, energy. And for G larger than one, essentially in the other, in the other phase, in the super -random phase, what we see is that this, uh, there is a logarithmic divergence at, the, at this uh, uh, critical excitation energy. And if you, if you are interested in the um, scaling properties, well, essentially for the quantum phase transition, we have this nice power law scaling. While in the, in the, um, for the GSQPT, what we, have, what we have is this logarithmic divergence, right? So here, this is just in the logarithmic scale, while it, this is not, right? So that's why we have a, a straight lines here. So basically we confirm the, the the presence of the USQPT in the bird rabbit model. And as we know as well, uh, the systems of the USQPT is also reflected in, in expectation values um, on the system, right? And this can be um, um, worked out essentially by considering this semi-classical um, approximation of the expectation value for a quantity A. And you can work it out in this manner, uh, relying on the hellman feynman theorem, where A is essentially um, a given by the, the partial derivative of the Hamiltonian with respect to some parameter, um, beta, right? And N here is nothing but the accumulated number of states up to, uh, up to an energy epsilon. So for example, the, um, the expectation value of a sigma z um, will follow this, this form. And as you can see, uh, basically the fact that the density of states is diverging logarithmically means that there will be a dip at the critical energy. And this is something that you can see as well. So basically the points as, uh, here correspond to an exact numerical diagonalization of the Rabi model for different values of eta and, and different values of the coupling. And you can see that essentially they very nicely agree with a semi-classical approximation. And for the sigma z, as well as for the number of excitations, say bosonic excitations. So you see this uh, manifestation of the USQPT in the observables of the, of the model. Okay, so with that, uh, I will move to the dynamical phase transitions and trying to link it with a, a critical behavior in the side states. Um, okay, so for that, let me first introduce what is a dynamical phase transition. So um, this is typically, a, well, this is a study um, basically on terms of non-analytical behavior in the non-equilibrium dynamics um, rather than in the eigenstates of the system. So basically uh, this is studied um, by um, uh, considering sudden quench scenario. So you start with a, um, with a state, and then you suddenly change the coupling of your of your Hamiltonian, and then you will have a non-equilibrium um, state. And depending on the on on the amplitude of this quench, you can find uh, some non-analytical behavior in the dynamics. And in this uh, regard, there are two types of uh, dynamical phase transitions. So one, uh, actually, that I refer to the first type, refers to a time average or the parameter. So essentially, you start with your initial state. You quench it and you let it evolve, right? So basically, it will it will, will evolve um, under this new Hamiltonian, um, and then you can compute an um, an order parameter or any uh, time average uh, quantity in this form, right? And if did, uh, if you find a dynamical phase transition, it means that there is an order parameter and or the time average order parameter will show the same behavior as the the standard or the parameter for um, the ground state, for an example, of your system, right? So it will be zero in one phase and then zero in the other. Um, however, there is another type of uh, dynamical phase transition, which refers to the non-analyticities in the loss echo. So essentially, the loss echo uh, measures the overlap between your initial state evolving in the in, in under the the new Hamiltonian with respect to the initial state evolving in the um, other uh, in the other uh, Hamiltonian with a different coupling. So typically, one takes uh, the initial state to be an, eigen, an eigenstate of the of the Hamiltonian 
T1. So essentially, this will be just a, a global factor, a global phase. Right? And if there is a, a singularity in the Lodge echo, then this will be reflected in the in the red function as it's uh, sort of kinks appearing at uh, critical times. And this has been uh, this has been a study quite um, quite a lot, I would say, uh, because there is a nice similarity between the Lodge echo and um, partition function for um, with um, a complex uh, temperature. So basically, you can draw similarities between them. And just to say that these types of uh, phase transition has been recently observed in the laboratory uh, using trap ions, essentially. And in that case, for instance, in a group of uh, Rainer Blatt um, in Innsbruck, they were able to see this uh, non uh, this non analytic uh, behavior of the rate function in a, in a long range IC model. I uh, will basically see that this rate function that they call lambda here for us will be R and uh, shows these kinks at certain uh, critical times of the, of the evolution. And in addition, the other type of phase uh, transition has been measured or has been observed in the group of Chris Monroe in Maryland, um, where basically they, they show that the average spin magnetization, um, again, in a long range uh, IC model, uh, shows this sort of um, um, or the parameter like a uh, behavior. So here they were they were interested in measuring or um, computing and then um, the average um, the time average um, uh, magnetization. So in our case, um, we have the the following Hamiltonian as I said at the no, at the beginning this is the rubber model, and we will start as typically done in this uh, um, in this scenario. We will start with a symmetry breaking ground state for g larger than one, and we will quench it to um, a different value, g2. And in the limit of eta going to infinity, we, we find the following non-equilibrium phase diagram. Essentially, if you start with a, with a g1 uh, equal to, to two, essentially, then you will find a critical value for g2 um, given by this expression here. And depending on the, the, the value of G2, you will, you will find different um, behavior. So in one phase, you will have that the average, uh, the time average um, of the other parameters such as sigma X and X will be zero. And the, you will find kinks appearing in this rate function. While if G2 is above the critical value, then essentially you have a non-zero order parameter and then a smooth uh, rate function. And Basically, the underlying reason for this uh, non-equilibrium phase diagram has to do with the lifting of the degeneracy in the, in the spectrum. So the, basically, whenever you quench it, your, your system to G2 larger than the critical value, the, the eigenstates will be still degenerate. And therefore, you will find that the, um, the order parameters are non-zero and the, um, the rate function will be smooth. While if you go to a different, below the critical point, the um, dynamical, the, below the dynamical critical point, you will find that essentially the eigenstates are no longer degenerate and therefore the time average uh, of the, um, uh, or the parameter becomes zero and you, some kinks will appear there as I will explain properly later. Okay, so, Actually, this line here, this critical line, um, G2 critical, given by this uh, equation, is nothing but the ESQPT in the system. So, and which can be derived uh, in the following way. So essentially you take the, uh, your initial state and you quench it to, the, uh, to a different value G2 and you impose that this, uh, the critical um, value is equal to the critical energy in which the side uh, phase transition is happening. And this, uh, this is so because essentially this uh, critical energy marks the lifting of the degeneracy in the spectrum. So in a way, you can see this uh, dynamical phase diagram as the, the energy that you have to give to your system such that will go above the separatrix in your, in your double coil potential. And therefore, um, you can, you can um, see that the um, symmetry breaking observable um, will have this form, right? And um, basically will be um, sensitive to, it will be um, given by the matrix elements uh, uh, between different parity sub, uh, subspaces. 
and will be oscillating with this uh, uh, phase and uh, given by the energy difference between different um, parity sectors. So if you are um, if you are above the the critical point of the of G2C, um, essentially you are keeping the 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 generality, and therefore this will be essentially zero. So whenever you take the the time average of the other parameter, you will find that the the um, it is non-zero. While if you go the below, then you leave the, the general C of the eigenstates, and therefore this will uh, oscillate and make you, uh, will make your time average to uh, to become zero. This perhaps can be uh, better explained in terms of the numerical results in the in the model. So for that, um, I am showing here the time average um, value of the sigma x and x for the bosonic mode. And for and the points again correspond to a full numerical um, uh, analysis of the Rami model with eta equal to 100. And as you can see, mm, the, the the points follow this order-like uh, um, behavior of the or the parameter-like behavior of them in the dynamical phase transition. And this dashed line corresponds to the critical point um, uh, G, G2C. Essentially, if you quench your system below this critical value, then it will average to zero. And some examples of the actual um, dynamical um, profile of your of these observables is, is found here below. So you can see that for G2 equal to, in this case, 1.1, which will be around here, you start with a, with a large value of sigma x because you are starting with a symmetry breaking um, front state. And then it will soon start to undergo oscillations, and it will average to, to zero. On the other, on the other hand, if you your quench is above the critical point, then you are still keeping this uh, degeneracy in the in the spectrum, and therefore your observable, the dynamics will will be always non-zero. It will be it will be essentially will show some oscillations, but in the average, the time average will be clearly non-zero. And the same happens for the um, displacement of, the, of the, the position of the bosonic mode. And another way to, to look at this is using a semi-classical approximation. And, and I'm showing here some Poincare sections in, of the, in the semi-classical approximation of the Rabi model. And as you can see, essentially, if you start, um, so this would be the phase, uh, phase space for the mode, right? As you start with a, in a, with a blue condition, Basically, you start with a symmetry breaking state here in the blue condition, and you quench it. It will be confined in this in this region. On the other hand, if you start with a, the equivalent um, but with the negative uh, value of x, then you will be confined in this in the other sector. And the same happens for the uh, spin degree of freedom. As you go closer to the to the critical point, then these regions will be enlarged, but still they don't touch each other. And yeah, in the moment that you go below the critical point, then essentially the phase diagram, uh, the phase space, sorry, uh, becomes joined. So you cannot distinguish uh, the which initial condition you, you took. So essentially, this means that uh, and so the time average will be will be zero. And the same happens again for the for the spin degree of freedom. Okay. And so what happens for the um, for the second uh, type of uh, uh, dynamical phase transition, which refers to the rate function. Well, um, in this case, we can replace again the, the number of atoms in a standard quantum anybody system by eta, and we look at the, this, um, this rate function. And what we will find is that they actually in the, in the limit of eta going to infinity, we will find that the, there are some kinks that will be proportional to the absolute value of t minus tc, where tc marks a critical and value of the, of the time, of the evolution time. And essentially, since we are dealing with, um, with a system with a um, discrete um, parity, the Loschmideko has to be computed um, in terms of the two equivalent uh, symmetry breaking ground states. So basically, this will have this form. And one can show that um, um, in this case, this will be given by the probability of overlapping with, the, with one of the um, symmetry breaking states plus the um, overlapping with the, um, the other uh, symmetry breaking state. And in this case, essentially, this probability, this overlap, um, will be given by the exponential of 
uh, minus eta some function. And this eta is essentially the parameter is, is going to infinity. So whenever you compute the rate function, you will find that um, you will find that it's given by this expression here. So the, the rate function is equal to the minimum of this f plus minus t. So when, uh, whenever they cross, uh, you will find an analytic behavior of the rate function, essentially at uh, these kinks happen in the rate. And there's something that you can, uh, you can check in this system as well. Um, and as I said, if you are above the critical point, then you will, you will see a smooth behavior of the rate function while, uh, while if you go below, then some kinks will appear in this, uh, in this rate function, right? And I'm showing here, for, uh, for example, the derivative of this rate close to the, one of the critical times. And as you can see, increasing the system size will make this derivative uh, sharper and sharper. Um, in general, it's difficult to find a closed solution, but if the G2 is equal to zero, then it becomes easy. Right, and you, and you can work out the these functions f plus plus minus, and one can work out that the rate function essentially behaves in this way. So the critical um, value, so the critical exponent for the rate function in this case will be given by one, and the critical times um, will be uh, given by this uh, in this form with n from zero to, to infinity. So basically, you have like a, a very um, you have a, a continuous no, a, like a critical times a separated by this and by this quantity. And in addition, you, one can derive the one over eta corrections to the to the rate that is given essentially by log two divided by eta. So, and essentially we follow we we are able to predict uh, to confirm the um, the theoretical prediction in the system. So with this, I close the, the part of the dynamic phase transition and the connection with the side state um, on the phase transition. And let, let me very quickly uh, show you how to do this in a single trap ion experiment. So basically, um, we, it is, uh, has been known from quite, few, uh, quite some time that it is possible to realize a quantum gravity model uh, using a single trap ion experiment. So, Basically, if you have um, an ion that is trapped um, with a, in a frequent in a trap with frequency nu, um, and subject to uh, radiation, to classical radiation, undergo basically producing transitions in the in the internal levels of the ion, um, one can the, uh, one can obtain an effective description that uh, follows the quantum gravity model. So, in the case, for instance, using a, a, a calcium atom. A, one a qubit can be encoded in the in these states that are separated by an optical transition. Um, so basically, in this case, uh, the um, the frequency of the of this of the qubit of the of the ion is given by this quantity, and um, it will be much larger than the trap frequency and much larger than the than the than the amplitude of the radiation. And Importantly, there is this uh, lambda parameter that measures basically the the ratio between the wavelength of your radiation and the zero point um, spread of the uh, zero point um, motion of the of the ion in the trap. So basically, in these experiments, it is possible to couple uh, the internal uh, levels of the ion with its motion in the trap. So here, this a dagger a refers to phonons in the in the in the trap. So I have said a bunch of approximations that uh, basically consider in this um, in that the frequencies are very large uh, compared to the to the trap frequency. So the frequency of the the spin is very large compared to the frequency of the of the trap. And also within the lambda approximation, basically assuming that eta is, is small and as well as a, you have a small number of um, of um, phononic uh, citations, one can um, uh, arrive to this effective uh, Hamiltonian. And what you can see here is that depending on the frequency of the radiation that you are sending to your to your ion, one can match, one can achieve red and blue sidebands in the um, um, coupling the internal degrees of freedom of the spin with, uh, with the motion. So basically, uh, a, red, a red side band will produce this sort of uh, um, interaction, while a blue side band will introduce the, 
the so-called counter-rotating terms. So basically, uh, one can show that uh, by leaving a small detuning uh, of these of this, uh, red and blue side bands, one can find an effective description that is essentially the quantum gravity model. But now, the, uh, the frequencies of these, uh, in, this, uh, in this effective uh, model are basically given by the detuning, so can be can be controlled externally, and it is possible to reach the demanding parameter regime to probe the critical quantum gravity model. So, and if you have more, um, if you want to know more about it, uh, as here are some references, um, as well as a recent um, experimental confirmation uh, using a single trap ion experiment. And with this, I arrived to the to the summary of the talk. So. I hope I convince you that the uh, finite component systems can display a rich critical phenomena um, and that it's a novel route toward quantum criticality and that the quantum gravity model uh, is a good example because it shows a ground state quantum phase transition as well as a silent state one and a dynamical uh, phase transition. So such a, a plethora of uh, critical phenomena. And as well that this critical phenomena, it can be realized in a single trap ion experiment. So, thank you. Oops. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricardo. So, a very nice and, and, and uh, first time that we speak about dynamical quantum phase transition apart from the introduction with with Pavel, so I think it, it's, uh, it's being a, a nice, very nice and interesting talk. So now it's time for, for questions or comments. So everybody that has a question or a comment, either you can raise your hand or just, just uh, unmute and ask. Uh, so Armando, I see the hand of Armando there. Armando, you're the first. Uh, hi, I don't know if you listen to me and I don't know if you can see me or not. Yeah, I, I can listen to you and you can, I can Hi. see you. <laughs> Hi, how are you? First of all, thank you very much for the talk because uh, this is the first time I understand why you can have a phase transition in a single atom system. Uh, previous to that, I just thought that it was a mathematical curiosity, but without physics. And now I understand that there is a lot of thi a physics in, in this thing. So uh, thank you for the talk. No, I'm mm, interested in the, in the dynamical uh, phase transition, especially in these kinks you you find in the time evolution. Mm -hmm. This um, yeah. So I don't know if it's a question or not, or just a thought. I just wonder if uh, this kind of th uh, kinks uh, will be also observed in a system with two degrees of freedoms. I mean, you know that uh, mm, excited state quantum phase transition in two degrees of freedom system are uh, smoother and you lot normally you lose many of the of the properties and it's just a, a thought i don't know if you have uh, thought about it or or not yeah actually um thanks for the question um i will say this actually the, the other way around I, I was surprised to observe it in a system with a single degree of freedom um, and this is because it was um first studied in terms of these um, spin chains. So the first work I, I know about it um, is this, uh, this paper by Marcus Heil, um, where they study actually the, the kinks appearing in, um, in one dimensional leasing model. And, and they show essentially that is, it is possible to, to find these, uh, these kinks. And needless to say, and, uh, a one dimensional leasing model has a, no, will have a making a large uh, decrease of freedom. And it is also interesting because um, in this experiment, they, they consider a long range uh, icing model. So basically, instead of having nearest, uh, nearest neighbors interaction, uh, they, they had basically a, um, a profile of interactions they gain algebraically uh, with alpha, uh, with some uh, parameter alpha. And in this case, they, they show that the, um, the results for alpha very close to zero, but not quite. So actually, it is possible um, to find these sort of kinks um, in, um, in systems with basically with more interesting uh, um, interactions. Yeah. And well, the same, 
I didn't say it, but uh, the same will happen um, for the LMG as well, right? Um, mm -hmm. And probably, and probably for the DK model too. Yeah, that I I'm, that I'm not so sure about, but I, I would say so. Okay, okay, thank you. Oh, may I go now? Yes, Jorge. So, thank you for the talk. Uh, I think it was very pedagogical, especially to, to, to see how the different uh, 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 phase transitions relate to each other in the, in the rabbit model. And I would like to, to, to continue with the question of Armando. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you show that dyna the dynamical phase transitions are coincide with excited state quantum phase transition in the rabbit model. Uh, I wonder how can one generalize this, uh, this statement to, to other models with more degrees of freedom. For example, in the, in the Ising model with long range interaction, would one expect some, uh, some strange behaviors in the spectrum of the model that could be related in some way to to an excited state quantum phase transition? Yeah, I actually, I'm not sure about it, but it's something I have thought about um, for quite some time. And I would like to, to explore it further, uh, actually, this, this topic, because I believe, um, so perhaps to put more in, in context, so in the long range is a model, if you take the, the coupling to the very long range, right? So if you approach the fully connected one, you recover the LMG, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you take the, um, the, the profile to be very, this uh, decay of the interaction is very, very large, essentially you will recover the nearest neighbor, uh, Ising model. So something in between is, is very interesting. And therefore it will be, uh, will be nice to see whether the properties of the USQPT survive for a finite, uh, for a finite range of interactions. How many spins uh, did they have in the system? Um, so I know the, in this case they have uh, 53. Um, I'm not sure in that in this other one, but it should be. And they have a legend here. Ah, yeah, so yeah, yeah, exactly. Ten, yeah. In this case, ten. Yeah. So this system can be easily diagonalized and look at the spectrum. In this case, yeah, yeah, indeed. 53, no, but <laughs> ten, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in this case, um, they consider a very long range profile. So in a way, they are, um, they are close to the LMG description because they have a fully connected system. Mm -hmm. This but is the quantum EC model, no? Yep, it is. Okay, yep. okay thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Ricardo, going back to the to the kinks, I have another question. But I see there is a hand, there is a hand there somewhere. Or if not, I will ask you another question about the kinks because you, you see these kinks in the Loschmidt echo, and and you know the Loschmidt echo is very uh, is closely related to this uh, auto uh, that. Uh, are now very much studied in different different fields. So you will expect also kinks uh, showing up in the in the OTOC, in out of time order correlators, if for for this system or or for systems with with an excited state quantum phase transition. Well, I don't know if um, I would expect kinks appearing in the in the OTOC, but I'm not so familiar with the uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. with the works uh, regarding OTOC and so on. But mm -hmm. definitely, I will expect something similar, perhaps to to the other to the other um, uh, type of uh, dynamical phase transition, right? To so this time or, uh, average or the parameter, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, the autoc will be. I mean, if you consider um, the, um, the operators in the autoc to be uh, related to the symmetry breaking, I will expect something similar um, happening here as basically what what we are observing in this case, right? But um, I'm not so familiar with them uh, without mm -hmm. sorry. 
Okay. No, it's, it's good that, that, that offers a new perspective, an interesting perspective. Ricardo, is, is there an, any revival in the, in the Sigma X um, average? Um, or... Okay. Um, well, essentially, since we are dealing with a finance system, right, um, because this has been done with a finance system, um, it might be that uh, after an extremely long time, um, extremely long, uh, you will find some revivals. And this must, must be related to the energy difference between uh, these states. So just to say, um, perhaps um, I can go back here. So the energy difference for a finance system in this case, right, is the order of 10 to the minus um, 12. So if you wait long enough, I guess you will find some revivals of this order. But yeah, I mean, this is a bit uh, an unphysical time to to look at it. I, I, there, is a, there is a hand. Jorge will will ask a question. Uh, I, I see in the definition of the second kind of dynamical phase transition, you have the logarithm of the square of the absolute value. Uh, and this is kind, the, the L is very close to a survival probability. So the divergence is just the, the moment where this survival probability goes to zero. So each time you have an oscillation in the survival probability and it smoothly goes to zero, you have this kink, this kink mm -hmm. in the error parameter. So what you are seeing here is a, a particular way of just seeing that the survival probability has some cancellation. And mm -hmm. in some system, in fact, nearly all the times the survival probability have at least a short times cancellations. Mm -hmm. or, and, and, uh, so it, it is peculiar because you decided to use this R parameter, which is the logarithm. But if you just plot the L, you will see just these oscillations in, in this parameter. And, 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 and yeah. that's it. I'm sorry. Yes, but uh, so I, I wonder why you call it a, a dynamical phase transition because it is just the that at some moment the 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 the, the evolved state at time t is orthogonal with the original state, and it happens many many times in many different systems. Absolutely, I agree. Um, the, one of the, the key points here is that um, it is a, when, whenever you take the limit of n going to infinity. So you have to, you need to have an infinitely number of um, um, uh, particles, right? At least in the, in the way it was defined by Marcus Heil um, in, this, in these papers. Um, and in that case, essentially what you see is that the, the, the survival probability will vanish uh, exponentially with the number of particles. So therefore, in order to see these, these kinks, you take the logarithm and you divide by, by n. So this is just a definition. And but the, in the, in the physics behind it is that um, this Loschmidt echo can be interpreted as a, as a partition function in complex temperature. So therefore, um, non-analytic behavior of this rate function uh, basically means that there are some non-analytic uh, behavior of this Loschmidt echo. But um, yeah, I don't know if this answers your question, but it's just a definition, the standard definition analyzing this uh, uh, second type of dynamical mm -hmm. phase transitions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. It was really, really very, very interesting uh, work. And I, I wonder if, if perhaps in the DK model, we can explore essentially the same kind of things. It would be very interesting. I would be deli delighted to, to do it, actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Ricardo, uh, but uh, coming back to, to Jorge's question, but, but really there is, there is a, a certain value of, of, of the control that was G2 uh, from which you don't have such an oscillation, no? isn't it? it, it, it um, sorry, I, I, I didn't get the first part, so. Yeah, can you come back to the, to the uh, okay, here. Here? I mean, you get this, uh, that correspond to type one or type two? Well, uh, here the phase diagram uh, shows both, right? So basically 
um, a smooth rate function corresponds uh -huh. to having a non-zero yeah. order parameter okay, yes. and kings whenever you have a zero order parameter. So, uh, if I understood correctly to, to Jorge, his point is that in general you will always you will get in the in the evolution of your of your state a given time in which your state will be orthogonal to the original one. But indeed, that only happened in the blue area, not yeah. in the red one. Yeah. So in, in this sense, it's, it not it, it doesn't uh, always happen. I mean, really, you need a, a certain value for 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 G two. Mm -hmm. So perhaps I can explain better the, this part. So essentially, um, there is a trick here if you want, because the Lashmet echo, um, I compute it in this form, but mm -hmm. I sum over the two possible contributions. So in a way, whenever you are in this um, red area, whenever you basically where you have a, a smooth uh, red function, it means that there is only a, an overlap, a non-zero overlap between your um, your initial state with one of the symmetry breaking states of your of your system. On the other hand, whenever you go above, um, or basically you if you go below the critical point, so entering in this blue area, you will have a non-zero overlap with both at different times. Mm -hmm. So basically, you will be you will be having non-zero non overlap between your uh, um, ground state, uh, your symmetry breaking uh, state plus or minus uh, and minus at different times. And whenever they cross, you will have an, a kink, because mm -hmm. essentially, if you look at this at this plot here, this first part will correspond to a non-zero overlap with respect to uh, the plus state, and mm -hmm. then this will go up. But soon there will be the overlap with respect to the minus, and it will go down. And whenever they cross, is where you have this, mm -hmm. this kink appearing. This is something that happens also in this case, right? So basically, if you were to consider only the overlap with respect to, the, um, to one of the symmetry breaking states, you will go up here and you will not observe uh, any kink. Mm -hmm. And this will basically mean that you have a, a smooth uh, rate function. But since you are considering the both contributions of the of the symmetry breaking ground states, the other overlap will go down and then this is the, the correct rate function. And therefore, whenever they cross, you have this non-analytic uh, rate function. Mm -hmm. So at, at the end of the day, it's related to the breaking of the degeneracy. I mean, in a way, have... yes, essentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is also related to the fact that, at least in this model, um, even in the in semi-classical approximation, you can see that, well, if you start in this blue, you never have an overlap with the red, unless you go and below the critical point. And in that case, essentially, there will be times where you, you will see um, non-zero overlap with respect to the orthogonal initial state. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. okay. So are there any any more questions for our speaker? Any more questions or comments or remarks, criticisms, whatever? If I if I can, I have um, one more. <laughs> you you it's your third one. <laughs> okay. Short one, please. Yeah, yeah. No, really, I I, I really enjoy enjoy very much. Me too, me too. <laughs> So you, you apply this uh, this scaling in the in the in the in the in the parameter of the Hamiltonian to this Rabi model, but um, in general, I, I I if I understood correctly, really you need a model in which, for example, in this case, the one of the number of particles in this kind in this kind uh, are the phonon, the sorry the the photons. The number is not defined. I mean, if you have a system in which is well. I mean, it's fixed the number of, of particle or, or boson or whatever. I assume that th this technique is not, is, not, uh, is not possible, isn't it? Yeah, so I guess you mean that if I start with a system, a finite component system, yes. it has a um, bounded uh, Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, it's not going to, to apply. Okay. So if, you, for instance, you consider just two, two spins, mm -hmm. with, um, no, like a spin mm -hmm. one half yes. interacting, then it's not going to, to happen because well you are you are basically um, bound to have a um, finite uh, Hilbert space. Yeah. yeah yes. So okay. that's why all of this phenomenology that I that I explained here uh, applies whenever you have a um, 
uh, well, I mean, in this case, um, um, bosonic mode, right? Because it already mm -hmm. tells you that the, uh, well, uh, it already gives you an, an, an infinitely large Hilbert space, mm -hmm. which can be explored uh, by having a nonlinear interaction with a, with a spin. Yes. That's uh, the ingredient. So, so far it has been studied in these, in these models, but uh, I guess in order to see similar um, behavior, you will need something. So one of the particles that has an, an already infinitely, infinitely large Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Okay, so then we, we thank again our, our speaker. Thank you, Ricardo. Um, Thanks to you. Uh, thank you, especially because you have been moving from, from Ireland to Spain and there has been a hectic times for sure for you. Uh, and I wish you the best in Madrid. Uh, and then we will meet next week for the next next uh, talk. So thank you uh, for everybody for the also for the listeners. Thank you to the audience, and see you see you next week.